everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books Podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and today we're joined by Stephen Cope. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Thank you, Ross. So great to have you here, Stephen. Before I get into Stephen's formal introduction, a few Banyan-related announcements. Uh, Although we have people joining us from all over the world, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound in Vancouver is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Banyan Books just completed our 50th anniversary year in 2021. That's 50 years as Canada's spiritual and healing resource. Since 1970, we've been local and independent. We encourage everyone to support your local independent bookstores. Anytime you make a purchase from Banyan Books, you support all kinds of wonderful programming like today's event. And you can find us at banyan.com, B-A-N-Y-E-N.com, or visit us in person, the corner of 4th and Dunbar in Kitsilano in Vancouver. Our guest today, Stephen Cope, is a best-selling author and scholar who specializes in the relationship between the Eastern contemplative traditions, and Western depth psychology. Stephen is the scholar emeritus at the renowned Kripalu Center, the largest center for the study and practice of yoga in the Western world. He's also the founder and former director of the Kripalu Institute for Extraordinary Living, one of the world's most influential research institutes, examining the effects and mechanisms of yoga and meditation with a team of researchers from Harvard Medical School, University of Connecticut, University of Pennsylvania, and many more. Stephen is the recipient of both a Telly and an Apple Award for his work. And in its 25th anniversary edition, Yoga Journal named our guest as one of the most influential thinkers, writers, and teachers on the current American yoga scene. Among his seminal works are Yoga and the Quest for the True Self, The Wisdom of Yoga, The Great Work of Your Life, and Deep Human Connection. Today, Stephen Cope is with Banyan Books in conversation about his new book, The Dharma in Difficult Times, Finding Your Calling in Times of Loss, Change, Struggle, and Doubt. An overview of the book. The Dharma in Difficult Times extends the message of Cope's best loved book, The Great Work of Your Life, which gave readers a roadmap for the journey to their true calling. As in great work, Cope here takes the ancient yogic text, the Bhagavad Gita, the epic narrative of the warrior Arjuna's odyssey of self-discovery as a model for the reader's journey. Then he builds on that foundation using the stories and teachings of famous figures, as well as stories of ordinary people and his own rich personal experience. Along the way, we find striking examples for finding meaning and purpose in our lives. Jack Cornfield says this of the book, inspiring, beautifully written, uplifting, tough and tender, a powerful book to raise your spirits and help you navigate these uncertain times with a clearer vision and a loving heart. Personally, I couldn't put put this book down. It's engaging. I was so inspired. It it illuminated so many different dimensions of the Gita for me. And I I have to say, I I cried uh, a, a number of times when I was reading it. I highly recommend this book. If you'd like to learn to m- more about today's guest and his work, you can visit his website at stephencope.com. Stephen, welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ross. What a lovely intro. I really appreciate that. We appreciate you joining us. So just the, the sheer uh, amount of research that you did for this book in terms of all the historical figures that you included tells me it must have been a number of years in the making. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about how this book came to be. Sure. Uh, Yeah, it was. Most of my books take about four years to write, Ross. And um, I actually began this book. So as as you mentioned, I wrote a book 
about 10 years ago on the Gita, which uh, I, I loved writing because I love the Gita. And then a year or two before COVID struck, I had a situation arise in my life that pretty much blew my life apart. So um, as you know, I, I begin this, this current book with Emily Dickinson's great poem that begins, my life closed twice before it's closed. It yet remains to see if immortality unveil a third event to me. So I got interested in what happens when your life falls apart. So I, in, in my own life, Emily's closed twice, as she said, before it's closed. And, and that was probably the death of her father and the loss of a, a romantic love attachment. Um, a couple of years before I started writing, I had this difficult situation where an organization, an institution that I'd been involved with for some time treated me badly, extremely unfairly. And um, I was in a huge quant in, in a way that, that really challenged my career. And I was really in a quandary about how to behave, how to respond, how to act. And then I thought about the Bhagavad Gita, which is probably the world's most sophisticated text on precisely this, what happens when your life falls apart. In this case, we have a situation in which Arjuna's life and world is falling apart because of a conflict uh, between uh, the, the righteous uh, and dharmic governing of their territory of Kuru and the usurpation of the throne by this evil adharmic family. So I thought, wow, I'm gonna go back to the Gita and see what I can find, see if I can identify with Arjuna. What happens when your life just tumbles apart? Um, Pema Chodron has written a beautiful book about this from the Buddhist point of view. I thought, okay, let's, let's write this book from the yoga point of view. So I started writing it and within the first year of writing it, the world fell apart with COVID and everything that happened thereafter. So the book that I originally began writing in I think 2018 or 19 had to profoundly change to reflect the, the current apocalyptic situation of our world. Um, and so I actually, uh, you talk about how much work went into it. Well. Right here on my desk in my office are quite a few chapters that were written in 2018 that never got into the book at all because the focus of the book really changed. And the reason for that is that I, I realized that the scripture, which we call the Bhagavad Gita, has been perhaps the most important scripture in the world aimed at the problem of uh, xenophobia, hatred, racism, all across the world. And so I decided to take this arc of the Gita, beginning with Gandhi, and Gandhi was certainly the foremost student of, of the Bhagavad Gita, and taking it from, um, then from Thoreau, who also read the Gita at Walden Pond, all the way through the present day to Ruby Sales. So I, I chose eight different characters who faced what we call the disorienting dilemma. So the disorienting dilemma is a dilemma that so undoes you that in order to resolve it within your heart, mind, and soul, you have to revisit your very view of the world and how things work. And you have to be open to a, a, a new understanding and a more nuanced understanding of, of how things work. So clearly Arjuna was facing the disorienting dilemma and through his conversation with Krishna, he reframes his understanding of the very dilemma itself. So I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig in here and see what I can find. And, um, and, and, and I did, and, and I selected these eight different individuals because they take us across a time arc from uh, small town Massachusetts in the 1830s all the way to rural Alabama in the in the present day with with Ruby Sales, so it was a it was a journey. You know, some some great author said, 
when you begin a great journey, you're never really quite sure what the destination is. So it's very true when you get, begin a book, you're never really sure what's gonna come out at the other end. So this book is, is pretty much a surprise to me. And, um, and, and there it is. That's, that's the short answer to your question. Wonderful, thank you. And this this thread that runs through in terms of uh, the freeing uh, the freeing of the slaves in America all the way through the civil rights movement to present day is a beautiful thread. Um, and you, you say this book you focus on the four simple facets of Krishna's teaching that speak directly to our time. And maybe if I can just name them and you can just give us an overview of why you picked those facets. So the first facet is take refuge in God. Number two is look carefully through the chaos for hidden signs of Dharma. Three, understand that true personal fulfillment and the common good always arise together. And four, when you fully surrender to Dharma, you are not the doer. Yeah. So, um, you know, in my first book, which some of you will know, The, the Great Work of Your Life, um, I tread very carefully around the issue of God and divinity because um, a lot of people won't go there with you, actually. So in, in my first book, I looked at what I saw to be the four pillars of, um, of, of karma yoga, which are discern your dharma or your true calling. Your dharma means duty, your, your authentic duty in this life discern your duty, do it full out, that is to say, bring everything you've got to it. This is called the doctrine of unified action. Bring your whole self to your dharma, to your calling, once you realize what it is. Third, and this is probably the most difficult, turn over the results, let go of the fruit. Krishna says to Arjuna, it's better to fail at your own dharma than to succeed at the dharma of another let go of the outcome, let go of success and failure. You, you don't even know what that really means. So discern your dharma, do it full out, turn over the result. And fourth, Krishna says to Arjuna, turn the whole process over to me. In other words, to God, because we discover halfway through that, that Krishna is really an avatar of Vishnu, one of the three great um, deities of the Hindu tradition. And so in my writing about that in my first book, I talked about turn it over to God or turn it over to something bigger than yourself. Don't, don't let your dharma be small enough so that it's all about I, me, and mine, but let it be big enough so that it's, it's uh, got a sacrificial quality to the greater good. In this book, there was no way that I could skirt around the issue of God. The Bhagavad Gita is about God. Krishna is a divinity. Um, and so that's where I started. So the, the very first section, there, there are four major sections of the book. And the first section is take refuge in God. Now, I, I start the book with Gandhi because uh, Gandhi, as each figure in the book faced a profound disorienting dilemma. One of those dilemmas that forced him to rethink everything. What was it? He returned to India after working in South Africa for 20 years and discovered the horrible mess that India was in after 300 years of British um, imperialism and colonization. He took a, a famous seven month train ride around India when he arrived home because he wanted to reconnect with, with his homeland. In, in South Africa, he had become a, a great warrior um, with the Bhagavad Gita leading the charge as it were, um, confronting racism and inequality um, in, in South Africa. Now he arrives home in India, his beloved homeland, and he finds this depth of resignation and poverty and the kind of resignation that comes from having been dominated by a colonial power for 300 years. Um, and his dilemma is, how do I help? 
is this my fight to fight? Just as Arjuna on the night before his great battle, his question was, is this my fight to fight? Should I fight or not? There are consequences either way. So Gandhi faced his biggest dilemma in, in coming back to India and having to confront the question, is this my fight? How do I fight it? How do I fight these odds that were it's massive in, with the amount of problems that, that existed in his home territory? And what was Gandhi's first response to his disorienting dilemma? Of course, Nehru and the others wanted him to move right into action. They wanted him to do civil disobedience the way he'd done in, in South Africa. But Gandhi was always upending the cart. And he said, no, I'm going into retreat. The first thing I have to do is build this ashram in Gujarat province, um, Sabarmati ashram, and go into retreat for about a year and pray and spin cotton into thread and meditate and chant to Ram and listen deeply inside to see what the answer to this is. Um, so Gandhi has to be our guide here, or at least I've taken him as my guide in this, um, because in my own dilemma that I vaguely outlined, I, I wanted to fight also. I really wanted to fight. I wanted to fight with the board of directors of this organization. I wanted to put on the, I wanted to pick up the sword, right? And instead, listening to Gandhi, I decided to basically go into retreat, pray, meditate, dive into all of the spiritual practices that I've been doing for 40 years, and listen inside. So in, in this first section of the book, I describe Gandhi's first response to the disorienting dilemma, which is to turn to his understanding, and he has a vast understanding of God. Um, it's not a bearded man in the, in the heavens, as you might guess. It saturates everything. Uh, it's, the, it's this divine presence in the unmanifest realms, as all of the great yoga scriptures say. Um, and so he that's where he turned. And he spent a year in meditation and prayer. And the goal of that was to connect deeply with his own inner voice. In chapter two, I talk about the, the, the second lesson. The first lesson of Gandhi is take refuge. And if you read the Gita, you notice that Krishna is always saying that. Krishna is always saying to Arjuna. And in this book, I try to make them real. I do this whole narrative treatment of, of the Gita. Krishna is always saying, dude, take refuge in me. Like, let me hold you. Let me help contain you and, and listen. So the first lesson is take refuge. And Gandhi's second lesson is listen for the still small voice. Listen inside. Because at the core of every great wisdom tradition in the world is this notion of uh, a deep, awake mind that knows and sees with a vast perspective. And the idea is we connect with this part of the, the mind, this awake mind, when we come into stillness and quiet. And, you know, the, the great Yoga Sutra, one of the greatest, the great meditative scripture of yoga says, when, um, when the mind becomes still, all wisdom is effortlessly self-revealing. So when the mind becomes still and quiet, we connect with this deeper part of the mind. You know, those of us who meditate know about what we call ordinary discursive mind, the mind that we immediately confront when we sit down to meditate. But we also know that eventually in our practice, we'll connect with this deep, it's like the deep part of the ocean, clear and, and, um, and, and unmoving and, uh, and settled. And so that's what Gandhi was going for. And of course, I tell the story in the second chapter about the way in which Gandhi was relentless in listening for that inner voice and not taking action until he was clear about what action to take. So the great march to the sea to make salt, which most of us know about, came out of that kind of um, 
intensive listening and meditation practice and chanting practice. Uh, it was counterintuitive. It was crazy. It was wild. It was incredibly successful. It completely baffled the British. By the way, just last night, I, I, I turned on the TV and Attenborough's brilliant film on Gandhi was on TV. So interesting, huh? There it was. So I watched wow. it. I highly recommend that everybody watches it. So, so I, I'm, I'm answering your question in long form. Please, please. So that's, that's the first thing. Take refuge in me. Listen for the inner voice before you take action. And we'll talk later about all of the kind of dilemmas that we all have right now, many of which force us to think about, I got to get in there, I got to take action. It doesn't matter how it shows up. Let me just get down to the square to, to, to protest. This is a slightly different view. This is like sit first, ponder, meditate, and act out of this deeper part of the mind, the part that knows, the part that knows in a kind of panoramic way. So I'll let you jump in. That's, that's just part one of the book. Take yes, one. yes. And I, I, I can't emphasize enough to our audience that how wonderful and inspiring this book is and pertinent, really pertinent right now, pertinent across time. I mean, it's based on the Gita. It's timeless, timeless wisdom. I want to remind everybody that uh, Stephen will be getting to your questions towards the last 15 minutes of our event today. So please, uh, as we're going along in our conversation, if something comes into your mind, type it into the Q&A tab on Zoom and we'll get to as many of those as we can towards the end. So the, the second pillar is to look carefully or peer carefully into the chaos for the sure signs of Dharma. And the first chapter on that is, it covers Henry David Thoreau, um, who, who you say the lesson is look first in your own backyard. And yeah. I understand he was a student of the Gita as well. How did that influence his life? He was. Uh, the Gita, this is such a great story because the Gita had, had only been translated um, a couple of, into English, that is, a couple of decades before Thoreau went to Walden Pond. And of course, it was discovered by Emerson, the, the English translation. Emerson gives it to Thoreau. Thoreau takes it to Walden with him. It's one of the few books he took and read constantly at Walden. But here we are again. We're back to the disorienting dilemma. So what's the dilemma that Thoreau faces? Thoreau is vehemently against three things that are going on in the United States in the 1830s. Slavery and the, the crazy disorienting dilemma that our very constitution and and, and all of our founding documents say that we are the land of the free, that all men are created equal, and yet that all those documents uh, supported slavery. So here's Thoreau in 1830 in, in little small town Massachusetts, and he's facing this question of, okay, I hate that my government is supporting slavery. I hate that my government is supporting the war against Mexico. And I hate what they've done to the Native Americans. And he was very close to, to the Native American population in, in Massachusetts. And, and so his question, which should be all of our questions right now is, do, what do I do? What's my job? What's my role? What's my calling? What do I do in the midst of this, right? And the, the one thing he had done was not to pay his poll tax as a, um, uh, as a protest against the way the government was acting. It was a minuscule thing to do. And one July afternoon, the, the tax collector came and caught him and put him in jail. And so Henry David Thoreau um, spent one night in the Concord jail, pondering the question of, well, as, as he said, why isn't it? everybody should be in jail? Everybody in this town who disagrees with the way the government is behaving should be in jail. And um, it was kind of a big deal. Thoreau was a big deal in Concord even then. He was, he was widely disliked. He was a little bit of a, um, he, was, he was a real character. And um, 
He was a brilliant student at Harvard who could never keep a job. He was one of the city's elite, but he hung out with all the marginal people. Um, he didn't go to church, which was unthinkable. Um, and, uh, and so people care, and he also was a brilliant scholar and gave regular talks in Concord. So people were really interested in what he thought about things. And so I tell the story in the book of the way Thoreau grappled with his duty. What's my duty in the face of, of an erring state? And he did it in typical Thoreauvian fashion. He, he made as clear a statement of the problem as he could. What's my duty in the face of this? Then he read everything he could read, especially the Bhagavad Gita, because the Bhagavad Gita, he was completely blown away by Eastern scriptures and mostly by Hindu scriptures. And the Bhagavad Gita is the central scripture in Hinduism and in the yoga tradition about action. It's, it's a scripture about karma. Karma, the word karma means action. Question is, how do I act in this lifetime in such a way that I'll be in alignment with my deepest soul and my deepest soul's purpose? So Thoreau read the Gita when he was trying to figure out how he should act, what would be uh, what would be the right action for him to take? Um, and he went off and in pondering this, again, he read everything that had been, been written about it in Europe and, and, and so forth. And then he wrote his great essay on civil disobedience. And he gave it as a talk around the area. Um, and it, it didn't catch fire immediately, but eventually it became one of the most important documents in American literature and uh, in American political literature. Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience was what he did. This is what he did. This is, it was his dharma to be a writer. It was his dharma to think things through for everybody. So that's what he did with it. He thought it through and he wrote this brilliant essay on civil disobedience which then influenced many, many generations of uh, human beings who were wrestling with their own disorienting dilemmas, all the way to uh, Martin Luther King, to um, uh, uh, Mandela, uh, to all the way through. Um, Even Gandhi, no? And, and Gandhi. Gandhi was a huge student of, uh, of Thoreau, and Gandhi read um, Thoreau's essay. So, um, so now we're talking about the second part of the book, which is how do you know your duty? How do you know your dharma? Dharma means true sacred duty, true calling. And um, I tell the story at the beginning of this section, the great story about Indra, the, great, the greatest god in the Vedic pantheon, which preceded the, the Bhagavad Gita time, but the great teaching story is the story of Indra, the great god of the Vedic dispensation, lived as these gods do on top of a mountain. He lived on Mount Meru. And it was said that he'd cast a vast net over the entire universe. And that the at the warp and woof strand of this net, at each warp and woof strand, it was a gem. And that gem was an individual soul. And it was that soul's job to hold together that part of the net. That's your only job to hold together your part of the net because otherwise the whole net starts unraveling from your place. Now, this is a wonderful story because it means, look at all the problems in the world. What do I do? What does a little me do? Well, you just have your own corner of the world, your own interstices between the warp and the woof strand. That's, that's what you do. And if you do that, then paradoxically, the whole thing is held together. So the story of Thoreau illustrates how it didn't seem like he was doing much, right? He wrote an essay. No, he did a huge amount because that essay was full of, of power and authenticity. And um, he did what he could do. He did his dharma and he made a huge difference. So um, the title of that chapter is Look First in Your Backyard. In our other words, he says, and I use this as the epigraph to the chapter, the best place for every man or every human being is where he already stands. That is, bloom where you're planted. 
Um, you know, many people have the idea that Dharma is this big romantic thing. And in order to find your Dharma, you have to leave your job selling insurance and move to Paris and paint, right? Um, no, for the most part, we're already, all of us are already close to our Dharma. What we really need is aim. So we need to aim it and refine it. We don't necessarily need to leave our whole life to, behind to find something different. Um, so that chapter yeah. even is, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say that raises a question I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, in the face of all that that has always been going on in the world and, and now as well, you know, this this feeling that we need to get involved in every cause or that certain people in our lives might say, well, why aren't you getting out there and doing this? How do we discern the, what our true call is in the face of all of these, these challenges going on in people's lives and decide this is actually what I'm called to do? And how do we actually have the, the rooting in ourselves to hold back from taking part in things that might actually take us away from our dharma, though they might seem like legitimate causes? It's such a great question, Ross. You know, I had a friend who was caught up in this very dilemma and she had, like some of us good Protestants, she had this notion that it was her job to save the world. And so she left a dharma, a calling that was truly her. She was running a retreat center in Maine. And she went off and became the campaign manager of a big leftist politician here in, in the South. Well, it just about killed her. It wasn't her job. It wasn't her calling. She was already in her calling. So what I've found is if, if you're already in your calling, like me, I'm a writer, I'm a yoga teacher, there's a tremendous amount I can do from the center of my calling that doesn't require me to do somebody else's calling. If I'm doing mine, and it doesn't matter whether it looks like it's the, the proper politically correct response. If I'm doing my Dharma, that is to say, if I'm pursuing the kind of mastery that, that Dharma calls out of us, I guarantee you, I will eventually end up somewhere at the center of the battle. So a good example is the book I just wrote that we're talking about now. That's not what I started out to write. But my dharma, my listening closely inside, I'm a writer, so I'm going to write a book. That's what I'm going to do. What book did I write? I wrote a book that turned out to be about the conflicts that we're all in right now. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not a hand-to-hand -hand fighter. I'm not much of an activist, although um, I can be at different times. I do what I do, I do what I'm called to, and I try to do it well, and I try to do it in a way that makes a difference. Um, be careful, everybody out there, of those big plans and schemes that you have about how you should help to save the world. Think Thoreau, you know, there's that great poem from the Tao Te Ching, think of the, think of the small as large and the few as many. Think of the small as large and the few as many. Um, so I don't know, does that help? Absolutely, absolutely. That ability to focus in on what's in front of us and understand the impact that it will have, even though we might not see it directly. Right. The third lesson, and I, I wish we had like three hours to talk, by the way, because this is there's so much we could talk about. But obviously, everyone, this is an overview. Please get this book. Um, the third lesson or the third pillar is understand that true personal fulfillment and the common good always arise together. And maybe I can quote, uh, you, you give a quote from, from the Gita, Krishna speaking to Arjuna, who says, strive constantly to serve the welfare of the world. By devotion to selfless work, one attains the supreme goal of life. Do your work with the welfare of others always in mind. And the first chapter is Charles Russell Lowell. And the, the title is Trust in the Mystic Power of Duty. Yeah. I mean, so I fell in love with this guy, Charles Russell Lowell, 
Um, it, it so happens that he's the great, great, great uncle of a good friend of mine. This is a chapter about, about duty, right? Um, duty in, in this chapter and in Lowell is about what you feel called forth to do from inside, not what's imposed on you from outside. Duty is the thing that if you do not do it in this lifetime, you'll feel a profound sense of self-betrayal, not betrayal of anyone else, of self-betrayal. So Charles Russell Lowell was one of that crop of fascinating young men who was graduating from Harvard at just the time of the Civil War. And these were very often young men whose parents had been abolitionists in Boston, uh, who had studied with Emerson, who had read Thoreau, who, who had read into the Gita and some of the Eastern literature. And they were a highly aspirational generation. Now I'm 72 right now. I, I am a baby boomer. I went to college during the 60s. We were a highly aspirational generation. We cared about the world. We cared about this fragile experiment in democracy that we're living through. Well, Lowell's generation was the same way. They were extremely disappointed with their parents' generation, which had not solved slavery or any of the other major moral issues that, that, that were happening in the, in the young country. And so, um, Lowell decided that it was his duty and, and this whole crop of young men they were all like names that we recognize from American history, right? Paul Revere, who was the great, great grandson of our Paul, of Paul Revere, et cetera. Rob Shaw, uh, Robert Gould Shaw, who led, um, who was this white boy from Harvard who ended up leading the, the first black battalion um, in American uh, history. Um, at any rate, Charles Russell Lowell, the most unlikely soldier, and most of these guys, curiously, had very little military talent, right? Most of them got killed or maimed or PTSD or whatever, but they decided that this was a moral issue that they were gonna have to stand on and step up on. Um, and Charles Russell Lowell was this very boyish, he was only, well, he was 29 when he entered the, the war. Um, he became a very famous, he was one of the few boy generals in the Civil War. He became a very famous cavalry commander. He had 13 horses shot out from under him. He had every part of him had been hit by bullets except his actual body. So his sword and scabbard and boots and hat. And he became a legend in, in, the, um, in the cavalry. And uh, finally, he was killed while, um, while conducting a raid on uh, General Jubal Early who had, who had stalled and he, he conducted a raid that was so important that it actually turned the tide of the Civil War. Uh, it, it, it assured Lincoln's election in the election of um, 1864. Um, but, I tell, I tell two stories in this chapter. I tell the story of Charles Russell Lowell, the unlikely hero in the Civil War and his, his wrestling with the question of duty. And I tell the story of a, a young African-American gay friend of mine, 35 year old black man who's a nurse, who when COVID arose in 2020, wrestled with the same dilemma, like What's, what do I do? He was a nurse. He was trained to help in these situations. He was in Ohio where his hospital mostly did just uh, elective surgeries and stuff. So he was, he was being furloughed. So his question was, just like Arjuna's, what's my role? What's my job? What's my duty? And he finally decided it was his duty to go to New York. They put him in the toughest hospital in New York City. He stayed for three months. And battled COVID. He took it on. He took on the battle. It's a it's a wonderful story. These these two stories about Charles Russell Lowell and and um, Toby. And it's partly a story of sacrifice, because according to Krishna, 
Um, there is some inevitable sacrifice in our dharma. Every dharma has at least some component of sacrificiality to it, where we have to sacrifice some part of I, me, mine, right? I told the story in my earlier book about Walt Whitman, who was at the peak of his poetic career when he became a missionary in the Civil War hospitals, uh, sacrificing his career. Now he had a great career after, uh, toward the end of the war because he became, he became the bard of the Civil War, and it's it's a beautiful story. So this whole this whole section of the book is about. Um, the fact that we're profoundly interconnected in this world. And those of you who know Buddhism know that there, there are three so-called marks of existence, anicca, which is impermanence, anatta, which is no self. And what that really means is we tend to think of I, me, and mine as a self under its own power. And the truth is we're profoundly interdependent. We, we're, we're actually, the self is, is a co-created phenomenon created with other human beings with whom we interact. So the idea is if, if you're gonna fulfill yourself, you're not gonna do it just for you. That's impossible, that will not fulfill you. There has to be some offering to the greater good, the common good. And I don't think this is so often commented on in, in current commentaries on the Gita, because we live in such a narcissistic world where we're all about I, me, and mine, my great career, my great writing career. And yet the true fulfillment comes in accessing this, this level of altruism and generosity and compassion. That's where you actually get filled up as a human being. Uh, so that's what section three is really about. And I also tell the story there of Sojourner Truth, the great self-emancipated slave. It seems that Sojourner Truth's story exemplifies more than anything that total giving over of oneself, that total sacrifice of oneself to the divine and to one's dharma. Yeah. Sojourner Truth, um, about whom I didn't know all that much when I started the book. So I read deeply into her life and um, she self-emancipated. She, she was one of the 30,000 people who were enslaved here in New York State. She, was, she just lived down the street from me in the Catskills. And she experienced all the horrors of slavery, rape, sexual abuse, torture, lashings, all of it. Um, and finally, at age 29, she picked up her, her son, one of her sons, and simply walked out of bondage. She walked away from it. And she had the courage to do this because she had developed um, an amazing, uh, she had developed an amazing practice of prayer. So her mother, whom she called Mau Mau, was, had these direct African-American roots. Um, roots in, in native uh, Afrocentric spirituality, which is all about the earth and the wisdom of the earth. And it's, very, it's shamanistic in the best possible sense of the, of the term. And so Sojourner Truth created, and this was a thing among slaves, what was called a rural sanctuary. Okay, so they'd go out into the country and create this little hut of branches and go in there, remember we're talking about refuge in, in this book, and that would be her refuge and that'd be where she'd pray and she'd learn to pray. And she learned from her mother all of the basics of the Bible. She could recite huge portions of the Bible. She was incredibly smart. Um, and so she developed this spiritual life on the, on the knee of her mother. And then as it grew, she began to get this direct guidance from higher power, from God, from the divine, which basically said, okay, her, na her name wasn't Sojourner Truth, and it was Isabella Baumfrey. But she, on, on Pentecost Sunday, she heard the voice of God say, you're going to go forth and teach, and you're going to teach about slavery and its ills, and about freedom and its possibilities, and you're going to be called Sojourner, 
And then she Sojourner asked God for a second name since everybody has two names and he called her Truth. So you're gonna be called Sojourner Truth. And she then became one of the most powerful speakers on the circuit of abolitionists and um, women's rights speakers highly regarded, absolutely brilliant speaker. She could stare down these halls of pissed off men. And a lot of the pissed off men, by the way, were, were clerics, what she called men in black, um, were clerics. And it turns out she understood the Bible better than they did. So she, she always won the argument. And there, I tell many stories about Sojourner's Truth, Sojourner Truth's interaction with um, with these crowds and and the way in which she had she changed them she changed she she contradicted every sense they had about who women could be could women be that smart and that powerful yeah who black women could be who a, who a, a slave could be so she she created the disorienting dilemma in her in her crowds, in her congregations, and um, just like made people's heads explode. She was a phenomenon. So I, I was thrilled to get to write a chapter about Sojourner. Uh, that might have been my favorite chapter because she was just so captivating. Yeah, yeah. The fourth lesson, the final pillar uh, is always remember that you are not the doer. And the quote from the Gita, Krishna says to Arjuna, those who know the truth, whose consciousness is unified around me, think always, I am not the doer. Yeah. Wow. Um, remember the four pillars. Discern your dharma. Do it full out. Let go of the fruits and turn it over to God. So the, the notion is that um, if you allow yourself to be filled up if, if you listen to the spirit and allow yourself to move, be moved by the spirit as Sojourner Truth did, you become then a channel for the divine mind in a way that your own individual consciousness could never even comprehend. The same thing happened to Gandhi, by the way. So if you read the story of Gandhi, you realize that he was listening to God, his connection with God all the time. And he said, the only tyrant I allow in my life is the still small voice within. To that, I must listen. And um, in, in this particular chapter, I tell the story of Marian Anderson. What was her dilemma? Marian Anderson uh, lived in the early part of the 20th century. She was a brilliant black woman who became one of the world's great contraltos, one of the greatest contraltos ever known to humankind. She sang in all the great opera houses of Europe, and yet she was not allowed to sing in so many venues in America because she was black. And the, the whole thing came to a head when she was prohibited from singing in Constitution Hall in Washington, DC. Constitution Hall was the hall that was built by the the Daughters of the American Revolution. And they said, no, nope, no Blacks singing in there. Well, um, Marian Anderson was a profoundly spiritual woman and she was totally guided by the spirit. Again, at the knee of her mother. Her mother was this, this wonderful Black woman who, who um, took her to church, found her gift in church. She became one of those great Black choir singers um, and then she found that she wanted to go on into uh, uh, the profession. But she was always guided by her, this deep relationship she had with God. And she, she never felt like she was the doer. The, the, she had a gift and she believed that she had a responsibility to the gift. You know, the great Jungian writer, Carol Pearson talks about this. We have a responsibility to our gift. If you're listening, Everybody has a gift, but what's your, you have a responsibility to that. And she felt it, this deeply, her responsibility to her gift. So um, in, in this chapter, I, I use a great quote from the Tao Te Ching, 
which says, um, the master sees things as they are without trying to change them. She lets things go their own way and resides at the center of the circle. She lets things go their own way and resides at the center of the circle. What's the center of the circle? Prayer, meditation, spiritual practice. That's where this woman lived. And as a result, she allowed herself to be used. She allowed her gift to be used to really to change the world. So just briefly to wrap up the Marian Anderson story, many of you probably know that she was prohibited from singing in, in Constitution Hall, but Eleanor Roosevelt took up her cause. First of all, Eleanor Roosevelt quit the DAR and said, you guys suck. Um, I don't want anything to do with you. And then she created a massive open air concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial for Marian Anderson to come and sing where she sang great um, black Negro spirituals, beautiful American music and some European music. Um, 75,000 people attended, people of all races and creeds. It was one of those moments that absolutely changed the world. And in, in this chapter, I talk about what Krishna calls the field effect, which is that when you're doing your dharma, you have an effect on the whole field around you. If you're actually moving uh, into the actions that are called uh, that you're called upon to act on, whether it's Gandhi or Thoreau or whatever, if you're acting on those, um, you are you are not the doer. You're a channel for the divine spirit. And, and you're going to have an effect on the field all around you, as Marian Anderson did. So things change. Of course, she was living in what we call in this country Jim Crow, uh, which is separate but equal, separate but not equal, but separate. And everything began to change for her. She eventually did sing in Constitution Hall. She eventually became the first Black woman to sing at the Met, and, and on and on. So the field effect is a, is a real thing. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we have some nice audience questions here. If it's okay with you, we'll get to a couple uh, of those. Totally dive in. All right. So there's one from Kristen who says, does the book go into how understanding the four varnas, personality or propensity, can help us understand our dharma, that which sustains? Uh, no, my book does not. Um, does not go into that. Um, the the varnas are so. Just for those of you who don't know what what this question is about, um, the varnas are are the the caste system, what we sometimes call the caste system in India. Um, and the truth is that when this book was written, when the Gita was written, probably in about the third century BCE. Um, you were born into your dharma. You were born into your caste. Arjuna was born into the warrior caste. This could not be changed. No one could change their, their, their sacred duty because it was, it was determined at birth. Now, you have to keep in mind that it's very common in traditional societies for there to be not so much a sense of a personal self, but a socially embedded self. Like the self is embedded in, in the social culture. And that's what was happening in India at that time. The self was not seen, there was not quite as much understanding as we have today of this vast personal, subjective, inner subjectivity, that whole world. Um, so your dharma was called svadharma, which means your own dharma. Many, very often, usually, as they develop, traditional societies leave that behind and do develop the sense of a personal self. And now, rather than svadharma or your own dharma, um, we talk about svabhava or your own true nature. So the question is, you determine your dharma not by your birth, but by what your own idiosyncratic mix of talents, of gifts, of callings, of opportunities, what's your particular idiosyncratic mix of, of those things 
that's how you determine your your calling now. So, um, you know, many people see the the Gita as as a scripture of Varna, the caste system. Um, but I can guarantee you that it's far transcended that. Gandhi was absolutely incensed about the caste system, and he insisted on including in his ashrams members of all castes. There was no such thing as caste for, for Gandhi. He insisted on including uh, members of all religions uh, in his ashrams, men, women. Uh, he was way ahead of us in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I can, I can tell you that. So that's just a little spec about, about the caste. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for the question, Kristen. Uh, the next one is from Jane, who says, what if you've arrived at midlife and still aren't certain you've discerned your dharma? Any advice besides upping spiritual practice? Yeah. Uh, so I like to say um, there are three really important kind of hunting grounds for dharma where I point students. Um, the first one is what's lighting you up? So um, what is it that you're fascinated by, that you're compelled by, that's totally lighting you up? This may or may not have anything to do with your job or the work you're currently doing, but I, I will ask students actually to make a list of what's lighting them up. And a lot of it will be mundane, but some of it will be little gems and important things to know. Um, because Dharma, uh, our connection with Dharma is profoundly energetic. We feel it. We, it's, there's a deeply felt sense of Dharma. And one of the fingers pointing toward that is what's lighting you up? It doesn't matter whether it is. It doesn't matter if it looks politically correct or anything like that. Maybe stamp collecting is lighting you up. Go for it. That's, that's, that's an important thing to know. So what's lighting you up? The second thing we've already kind of talked about is what do you feel as a, a deeply felt sense of duty? Maybe you have three kids and you feel a profound sense of duty to those kids, as you probably should. Um, that's the second thing to look at. In other words, you've chosen, you've, you've made a choice. And the question now is, are you going to choose the choice again? So what's lighting you up? What's that deeply felt sense of duty? And remember my definition of duty, the thing which if you do not do, you will feel a profound sense of self-betrayal. And then the third is, is there any challenge in your life right now? An illness or the loss of a job or the breakup of a relationship or a divorce? Is there any difficulty or challenge that you're facing right now that actually could be the outward and visible sign of a dharma. So I, I tell the story in my first book about dharma of Marian Will, Marian, um, uh, Marian, uh, Anderson. And, yeah, no, 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 Marian. Oh. oh, in your first book, sir. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, I can't believe I'm blocking her name. Great Jungian analyst, um, doesn't matter. At any rate, she's one of the greatest. Wonderful. That's right, Marian. Marianne Woodman, thank you. She's a dear friend of mine. Um, she's probably listening. She's, she's transcended this life, but um, she and I taught together a lot. She used to teach with Robert Bly. She's a fabulous teacher. Well, she got horrible bone cancer and was supposed to die. And she decided, okay, I'm taking this cancer on as my dharma. This challenge, is not gonna be just a sidebar in my life. This is it, this is it. She closed her practice. She took it on like a tiger and she survived it and thrived and spent many years living a great life after that. But uh, I think I called that chapter in my last book, uh, when difficulties arise, take them as your dharma. You may or you may not decide that, that that's a dharma, but that's one of the, the hunting grounds. So what lights you up? Duty, difficulty. Um, and, and then also consider the fact that you may be, what's the name of, of my questioner here? 
Uh, this is from Jane. Jane? Jane, consider Jane. the fact that you, you may be already in your dharma. Um, I find this is not infrequent. The people are already inhabiting their dharma, but they just haven't owned it. They haven't aimed quite well enough. I tell the story in, in my first book about this of a, of a priest who got his calling right. He was called to the church, but he wasn't called to the priesthood. He was called to be the music director. And until he got, he was in the right church, but the wrong pew. Until he got into the exact right pew, he didn't feel fulfilled. So many people get close to it, but just miss it. And, and missing Dharma by an inch, you might as well be missing it by a mile. Aim is everything. Aim it. Name it. Uh, Walt Whitman, when he became uh, a missionary, well, he named himself. He said he, he had this, this leather bag and it said soldier's missionary. That was his new Dharma. He, he had a name for it. So he was clear about what he was doing. It didn't say poet. It said soldier's missionary. So check around and see if you might be closer than you think. <laughs> Thanks so much, Stephen. And thank you, Jane. No, we're just getting towards time. Stephen, do you have time for one more audience sure. question? Yeah. yeah, okay. This one is from Priscilla, who says, you said that, <laughs> hi, Priscilla, <laughs> you said that this book was a surprise for you. What is it that surprised you? Well, I started writing. So in the original book, there was a chapter on St. Ignatius Loyola. There was a chapter on Rachmaninoff. Uh, there was a chapter on Darwin. And there was a chapter on uh, Jean-Pierre de Cassade. These were all white men who had encountered the disorienting dilemma. And in the times that we're living, I could no longer write a book just about white men, right? Wrong, absolutely wrong for the times. So I, those are over there. I might get to them. They were great chapters, by the way. I might get to them at some point, but I needed to focus in on, you know how Arjuna was called, and it's not an accident. Arjuna was called to the greatest battle of the age. So we are all called to, in some way, through our dharma, touch into the problem of the greatest battle of the age. And right now, in our country, in my country, um, there, there are several, but one of them is racism and white supremacy. One of them is global warming. Um, one of them is the confrontation between autocracy and democracy. I'd say there are three right now. So I was darned if I was going to write a book on Dharma, especially after COVID ripped the mask off uh, that, that didn't touch into um, one of those three areas. So it was a surprise. It wasn't really what I what I'd aimed at, but I'm happy about it. <laughs> so am I. It, it, I, yeah. I it's such a great book. Uh, now, before kind of closing questions, Stephen, I just want to take a moment to thank our, our Banyan community and audience for being here live. It's so great to have people joining uh, for the live broadcast. And as you know, all of these episodes go up on Banyan's video and audio podcast on, on YouTube or uh, on anywhere that you can find audio podcasts. You can look for the recordings of these episodes. Uh, just look for Banyan Books in Conversation. You can like us, follow us, subscribe, turn on notifications so you know when the new episodes uh, go live. And a big thanks to our, our uh, podcast producer and events curator, Jacob Steele, for everything he does. And of course, uh, to you, Stephen Cope, for your, for your time today and your wonderful work. We've been speaking about Stephen's new book, The Dharma in Difficult Times, Finding Your Calling in Times of Loss, Change, Struggle, and Doubt. Uh, of course, you can get it at Banyan Books, banyan.com. If you want to learn more about Stephen, you can go to his website, stephencope.com. Stephen, before we say goodbye, can you just tell us for people today, you named these three big issues that, that are going on in the world. Um, what would you say, and I know at the end of the book, Ruby Sales 
has some words for the young people today. What would you say to young people today about finding their dharma and and living fully out their their life purpose? Uh, it's absolutely essential. In the you know Henry David Thoreau said almost two hundred years ago, you should always be on the trail of your deepest nature, for it is that that connects you to the divine. So the it can be a long journey. It can be a long journey, and and I think Jane talked about this. Um, hitting midlife and not quite sure. By the way, there is a chapter in the book on Harriet Beecher Stowe who did not find her dharma until midlife. And then she exploded like a star. Um, and, and I don't mean a celebrity, I mean a star. Um, so, uh, so it's worth the effort to put into reading and studying and talking to your friends and the people that you rely on and, and understanding what this dharma is, because there's nothing, there's no more exciting way of living than living your dharma. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Stephen Cope, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure, Ross. Thanks. Thanks to everybody. Come and see me at Kripalu. <laughs>